Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Eat, Meet, and Question Everything. Today, I have Serena with me. Yay. Yay. Hi, Serena. Hi. I'm so excited to have you. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk to each other every day in text Mm -hmm. and voice messages. So Uh let's just bring those conversations out to the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, having you to like bounce things Mm -hmm. off of and to vent my frustrations with has just made a huge difference, honestly, in my daily life. Like just being able to pick up my phone and send you a quick voice message because I'm having a problem or I'm stressed or because things are great or because I had a great workout, you know, or whatever um, has really made a difference for me, like helping me stay on track and, you know, to know I'm not alone with my problems too. I mean, that's, that's the part of having a community, right? Is to not feel like you're alone. It's just you having those problems. Exactly. Yes. And same. I mean, poor Serena has had to listen to me <laughs> bitch and moan about this whole cookbook process too, <laughs> but it's been great. Um, so yeah, let's just kind of start off like with where we're at on our journeys right now. Cause I know like we've both kind of been struggling a little bit lately and that's one of the main questions, um, I got to is like where we're at, where you are at in your yeah. weight loss journey. So mm-hmm. spill the beans. Okay. I'm not proud of it um, at this point. For a while, I was proud of it, and now I'm not so proud of it anymore. But um, so so uh, most people who have seen my videos know that in the beginning, I gained 18 pounds on carnivore um, slowly over an eight-month period. And we'll talk about this, I know, but um, I, firm, I firmly believe that I was not eating enough when I gained that weight. I know it sounds ridiculous. We can get into that. Um, then I ended up losing 35 and maintained most of that. I mean, like, you know, when you go off of weight loss mode, you tend to kind of go up two or three pounds. It's just kind of typical, like you're off weight loss mode, you know, so you're just not quite being as careful. So you might gain a couple of those pounds back. So that first five, I'm not counting as a gain necessarily. If I was, it would be 17 pounds that I gained. Um, so I'm, I'm going with 12 because that puts me in a pretty happy place. So I'm trying to get that back off. Um, and it's frustrating for sure. Um, you know, and I am one of those people who, when I'm telling people what to do after like the first month or two, I tell people track your calories. Uh, if, especially if you're not losing that, if you're losing and you feel great, no need to track your calories. And I know people say, oh, don't track your calories on carnivore. You don't have to do that. But I, but if you're not losing or you were losing and then you got stuck, or if you're gaining, it's important to go ahead and track your calories because you could be under or overeating. And so I always give people that advice. And I would say, honestly, 50% of the time, maybe more than that, maybe 75% of the time, the people are under eating and that's why they're not losing. And so I always say, track it so you can tweak it. You know, it's like a little phrase I made up to help people like track it so you can tweak it. And then I don't track it so I can tweak it. So isn't that the way, right? Landscapers usually don't have pretty yards, you know, like, so here I am up 12 pounds, And I'm not tracking it so I can tweak it. And that just is so not smart of me. Um, And so about three weeks ago, I guess it was, I interviewed coach Bronson Dant. And we talked a little bit about that. And he gave me some advice on how to, you know, find the, my proper macros. And it was a little bit similar to the macros that you had been eating and having success with. So I went with that, but nothing happened for like a week and a half. So I adjusted them and just copied yours. And that seems to be working pretty well. (laughs) That's awesome. <laughs> um, well, that's good. So you're, have you been losing then lately? Um, I did for, I did um, <laughs> not so much right now. So I'm, you know, trying to figure out what I need to tweak. I lost a couple of pounds and I felt pretty good. Felt like I was on the right track. And it is nice. Like I know a lot of people feel that tracking is just such a terrible thing and we shouldn't have to track, especially as carnivores. But I feel like it can actually be kind of nice because in a way it it like reduces the stress of the whole process kind of. So for me, I really am a numbers person. I like to know what's going on. So the idea of not tracking does bother me a little bit. You know, it's, it's, although I've sent you multiple messages, I hate tracking. I hate tracking. This is so dumb. Why am I doing this? But at the same time, I I feel like it's working. So I think tracking can be a really great tool in our toolbox to help us get through this process, to help us, you know, with our journey. And so I do think a lot of people should track. I know that's like, whoa, nobody likes to talk about tracking. People also don't like to talk about we- talk about weighing yourself. And people will take their scales out and bash them on the ground and throw them in the dumpster. And I just think that's so dumb. I just feel like if you're not tracking your food and you're not weighing yourself, like, sure, you can say, well, it's working because my pants are a little bit looser. 
but what if your pants aren't looser, right? What if it's not working? Then what do you have? You can't check yourself on the scale to see if it's working if your goal is weight loss and you're not tracking your food because you've sworn against tracking because now you're a carnivore and you don't have to. What tools do you have left, you know? So I think if you can be not obsessive about the scale, which I weigh almost every day, it's just who I am. But I think if you can not be obsessive about it and not let it ruin your day, if it's, you know, not good news, then I think it's totally worth weighing yourself and totally worth tracking your calories. I think the tracking has given me direction. Like instead of just being all willy nilly about what I'm eating and, and I do snack typically, even though I know most carnivores, you know, try not to snack, you know, there are days where I feel like I'm kind of eating all day, which I know isn't the goal. And that's not, you know, what we should do on carnivore, but Food is a comfort. It just is. Sometimes even for carnivores, it's just something, you know, you go to the refrigerator when you get stressed. And although I'm eating the right foods, you know, sometimes maybe it's too much. Sometimes it's definitely too little for me. And so anyway, yeah. So, um, so I still have about 12 pounds to go, but I'm working on it. I have direction and that helps me and, and gives me hope. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, yeah, I have the same feelings about the scale. I mean, it's just another like data point and yeah. it's something that's helpful for me. And for me, like, I don't have a bad relationship with it. Like if it's lower then it's like, Oh great. That's encouraging. If it's not, then it's like, okay, like I need to do something different. Like it doesn't right. get me down. It's just more information. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I get a lot of messages like, oh, you know, I've been doing this for a month and I haven't lost any weight. Why is everyone so focused on only using the scale? It's like, okay, did you take pictures and measurements? No. It's right. like, okay, did you go get it in body scan or did you measure your fat? No. It's like where so many people are just focused on that. And it's like, that's just one piece to the puzzle. And mm -hmm. it can make you not feel good mentally if it's not working and right. the scale can stay the same, but your body composition can be changing. Yes. So definitely everybody listening, like right now, go take some measurements, go take some pictures. So you have other ways to track what you're doing and don't just rely on the scale. Those messages drive me nuts. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, and I'm always telling people, like, as soon as I know somebody is starting, I tell them, take a selfie, like straight out arm's length, take a selfie because that is going to be your encourager later. Because, you know, after, after the fun wears off of eggs and bacon and sausage with cream cheese for breakfast every day, once the fun wears off a little bit, and for some people, the food starts to get monotonous for a while, you kind of get that palate fatigue people talk about, like you start to feel like the food is boring, which eventually comes back around and you'll love it again. But I feel like in that case, so two, three, four weeks down the road, when you're at a birthday party and everybody else is having cake, you have that picture. And if you're ever questioning yourself, go ahead and take another one and put them side by side. You know, some of those apps are free and they're so easy to use. Like pick collage is so easy. You just pick your two pictures and it puts them next to each other. And I try to zoom in. So my head is the same exact size on both of them, you know, so I can see. Um, but I have seen people where you think it's a different person and they're only down like 20 pounds, but the inflammation makes such a big difference. So even when the scale is not moving, like Courtney said, even when the scale isn't moving, and even if you didn't take measurements like I didn't and I wish that I had, even if you haven't done those things, the proof is in your face, you know, in that selfie. It can make a huge difference on whether you win or lose the day, I think, if you are feeling encouraged or if you're feeling beat down. Yeah, totally. I mean, because it's almost like you forget what you looked like, too. Like, mm -hmm. when I see pictures of myself from two years ago, I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, that was me? Like, yeah. I didn't look like that in my head. Like, so right. I see it, and it's like wow, like huge, big, fat face. And it still like blows me away. Not a big, fat face. It was bigger than it is now. But it was like, <laughs> I see it and it's like alarming, like a jump scare. Like I, yeah. I see stuff oh where it's like, God, I look like I was in like in a movie wearing a fat suit. So definitely mm -hmm. take some pictures. And I would say it's not too late to take measurements. Like yeah. if I were you, I would still do them. You know, then yeah. you have a base point from going right now. From now, from yeah. now at least, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, back to the macros, like I do track macros right now. I think it's um, great if you don't have to, but it just depends on what your goals are. Like I took a lot of time off from tracking macros because I needed a break. Like I've been in weight loss mode for the last 25 years, you yes, know, same. and you can, you got to take a break sometimes. And I've learned that I can be in maintenance mode and not track macros, but right. that it's really hard for me to lose weight if I'm not tracking. And I think a lot of people have that issue too, because, 
you know, I feel like a lot of us are came to this for a weight loss thing. And if we were overweight, that means we had an issue with food. So the majority of us, you know, were eating food for comfort. So it can be hard to reset those habits and, you know, not overeat on carnivore. Like I know you struggle with under eating, but I could easily overweight, overeat, uh, overeat. And the mm -hmm. macros kind of help keep me in check. Like, right. okay, like, am I really genuinely hungry for this or am I just wanting to eat it? And most of the time I'm just wanting to eat it. And lately I've been eating, <laughs> even yeah. though I know like, oh, these are my macros and I'm done with my macros for the day. Like lately yeah. I've been like, I don't care. I'm going to eat this. And it's definitely like an emotional eating thing. And that's a whole other topic. Like we could go down to on, mm -hmm. you know, how to not do that and, right. and feeling your feelings. And maybe we can yeah. touch on that in a little bit, but I want to go back to what you said about not, not eating enough and that making somebody gain weight because i do see that um that that's what happens to some people so i definitely don't want to dismiss it but it almost doesn't make sense and a lot of people are like there's no way there's no way you're gaining weight by under eating like you're clearly eating so much so let's like talk about this and i am curious then because I know a lot of like the experts also are believing what you're saying too. But like, since you just had um, Bronson on, did you guys talk about that? I'm not sure. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm you not just, positive. I know Cause you just said you general. talked macro. So I wasn't sure yeah. if you were talking about that side of thing. Cause he's pretty can, like no nonsense. I'd be curious yeah. his thoughts on that. Yeah. I'll have to go back and listen <clears throat> to it. I can't remember The video just went up um, last week. I cannot remember if we talked about that or not. But, no I, worries, but I was yeah. out of town for a week long basketball tournament since then. And I have no idea, like even what day of the week it is. I was going to say, you days. must, you must be fried. <laughs> yeah. I'm exhausted. Um, okay. So, um, so the under eating thing. So I know that for me, that is the cause of it, whether or not it seems possible, whatever. But I can honestly say that there was a point about Six years ago, I went to a, um, a special doctor. It's a muscle response testing doctor, like nutrition training. You guys have to look that up and look at videos on YouTube. It's really interesting. Lots of people think it's like voodoo or something, but it's really cool the way they test you and see if certain things agree with your body. But anyway, he put me on a low carb diet. He wanted me to do kind of keto. And I became carnivore without knowing that's what I was doing because if somebody tells me eat very low carb, I think, well, if low carb is good, then no carbs must be better. Right. You know how I, you know what I mean about that, right? Let's like be <laughs> all or nothing kind of thing. And so like, if I'm going to eat one cupcake, I'm going to eat 12 of them. If I'm going to eat one Oreo, I'm going to eat a whole sleeve. Like that's just who I, who I was. And so he wanted me to eat low carb vegetables, but of course I didn't do that. I didn't even have blueberries for gosh, like six or seven months. I did this with like just meat and I didn't eat a lot. But he also had me incorporating some fasting and I wasn't losing weight. This was a long time to not lose weight. And I wasn't losing weight. And again, I believe that it's because if this much food is, if like normal food is this big, if this much is good for losing weight, then this much must be better for losing weight, right? And so I wasn't eating very much. And I even did a 72 hour fast. So it was my first like long fast like that. And we as a family were driving to New York City. We drove through the night at the last point in my fast. And I was like, I was flying. I was doing so great. I'm the one that drove in the middle of the night. Part of the time I was wide awake listening to an audiobook. I mean, I was feeling really good on this fast. And I broke my fast that morning at the hotel. We walked 17 miles that in a two-day period as a family. And our youngest was like eight at the time. We locked all, walked all these miles. I ate. Um, you know, a few hamburger patties, maybe a steak, you know, besides breakfast at the hotel, which was, you know, it was real eggs and then some bacon and sausage. Yeah, there might have been a little bit of sugar in them. But we came home 48 hours later and I weighed exactly to the ounce what I weighed before I started my fast. Oh my gosh, I would okay. have cried. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, you want to talk about pressure. And there have been other times where I've done 48 hour <clears throat> fasts. And when I get on the scale before I break the fast, I weigh exactly to the ounce what I weighed before I started fasting. So I know this is a metabolism thing for me. And I know there are so many other, I'm not, I'm not an anomaly. There are lots of other women out there who struggled. I'm 50. So for 35 years, I was on a diet every day, like you said, in diet and weight loss mode for all those years, right? I was 12 when I bought my first diet pills. That's when it started for me. 
And so I know I'm not alone though in women that have done juice fast and the cabbage soup diet and weight watchers and restricted and 1200 calories a day and you know only lean protein you know like all of these things i'm not the only one who has messed up their metabolism so if it can happen to me it can happen to other people if i can do a 72 hour fast and not lose an ounce there's something wrong right and so in the past and i didn't lose weight going to that doctor doing what he told me to do even i didn't lose weight and i was trying to lose maybe 15 or 20 pounds at that point um, but I went to him for other reasons too, like, you know, just check my hormones, my vitamins and minerals and all that kind of stuff. Cause it's like, a, it's like going to a naturopath basically. So I was going to him for other reasons, not for weight loss, but that was obviously part of it. Like, why am I not losing? And it just didn't work. And then I tried Weight Watchers um, about three years ago, which I had done before in the past and it had worked for me. And for the first um, three weeks or no, for the first three months, I lost nothing. Following my points, to its he, I lost nothing. And then one day I sat down and said, how many calories am I eating? And it was 900 calories, give or take, you know, a hundred that I was eating every single day for three months. And I wasn't And that's losing. following what they're telling you. Yes. What their recommendations were. That Yeah. Then, I've course, done that in the past too, but I never knew like what my macro, like I didn't know about macros yeah. at the time. Um, yeah. I just followed the points. That's interesting. That's so yeah. low. So low. And so many people do that. You eat you know, and that was whatever the new plan was, like you didn't have as many weekly points, but you had more free foods or whatever, like something like that. And so I upped, I started tracking my calories and my points side by side. Like every day I was tracking both of them and I would do my points, but then I would make sure I had enough of that free stuff to take me up past like 1300 calories because you, you can track the free stuff but you don't know what the calories are. And you're not supposed to have to use calories, but I was under eating for sure. As soon as I raised it up to like the 1300 calorie mark, 1400 calories, bam, I started losing weight. I lost like 15 pounds fairly quickly. So I know that this happens to me. Now, granted, I wasn't gaining when I was under eating. I was just maintaining, but the scale goes down. And if this is you, this is your problem. Scale goes down a pound. You think, yay. The next day it's back up half a pound. And you're like, darn, what did I do? And the next day it's back up the other half a pound. And you're like, what happened? And then you're back down that pound. Then you're up a whole pound. And you're staying within the same one or two pound range on the scale for like a month at a time. This is probably your problem. You're probably not eating enough. Um, and for me, when I started carnivore, there was all, everybody wanted to fast, right? I was in a group where we talked a lot about fasting. So I wanted to fast. I wanted to do that. I Fasting is healthy. I know that. So I set up like rolling, I guess they call it like rolling 36 hour fast. So I fasted Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I ate the same thing every day. I ate two hamburger patties with some butter on them. That was all I ate. And at that point, I didn't have much of an appetite because I'd been starving myself, right? I didn't have much of an appetite. It wasn't very many calories, but I did, wasn't looking at it like that. Like, if I'd have put myself like outside of my body or something for a few minutes and like tracked in my calories, even in my head, I would have said, what am I doing? This is eight or 900 calories a day. This is going to put me back, you know, where I've always been. And then on Sundays, I ate a little bit more, not to the tune of enough pounds to actually gain weight if 3,500 calories is in fact a pound. But I think that's not, that's not the case for some, for some people, for everybody, that's not the case. It's not like, it's not like just basic math. If you eat an extra 3,500 calories today, you are not guaranteed to gain a pound, right? There are so many variables in there and sleep and hormones. There are so many different things. I don't think calories in, calories out is just cut and dry like that. And that 3,500 calories equals a pound flat out, you know, no matter who you are, that 3,500 calories is a pound. That's not fair to people who, like me, are in that situation where they can't lose or they're gaining and eating minuscule amounts of food. And I think it's unfair to say this is not why you are not losing weight. Because for somebody who's in the situation that I was, where I'm literally doing everything I can, using all the tools in my toolbox, I'm fasting, I'm eating just meat, you know, and fat. And I literally was eating two hamburger patties. And it was like pre-measured on the package. It wasn't like I was making the patties myself. So they were twice as big as they should have been. They were the frozen ones that are already measured out, just the beef, you know, and I would add, it was probably half a tablespoon of butter to each one. You know, I mean, that's literally what I was doing. So I knew what I was doing. I could not understand. People kept saying, oh, you're just healing. Oh, you're just healing. Sometimes it takes a while. You're just healing. And so eight months go by and I realize I'm up 18 pounds. Now I didn't, obviously I didn't fast every other day for the entire eight months, but that's where I ended up for the last month and a half or two months of it 
And even before that, I wasn't eating very much because that's just who I am. If I am not tracking my food, I am not eating enough. That's just who I am. And so, um, so anyway, I was going to say something else, but I'll say it later. So anyway, this particular time, like I'm up this weight and I finally decide that's it. I got to crack the whip. I got to figure out, you know, what's going on. And I'm obviously under eating again. And so I start tracking my calories and eating more. And within the, you know, two weeks or so, two pounds is gone. Right. So, so it's the same situation. And I know that I wasn't overeating before and that that's why I gained the 17 pounds, like a typical day. I would not eat breakfast. I would wait until lunchtime. I would have three eggs fried and a tablespoon of butter. And then for dinner, I would have one hamburger patty with some cheese or two hamburger patties, you know, just plain with some salt on them. And that is not enough calories for a toddler. So I know that I was not eating that much. There were days where I ate my normal amount of calories. I mean, I'm not going to say that I under ate every single day, but I think for somebody like me, because I know you and I talked about this, it doesn't make sense, right? How can you gain weight under eating? And I've talked to multiple people about this in interviews, like doctors and asked them, Dr. Chafee and I talked about it, um, Dr. Tony Hampton, and I talk, talked about it with a lot of people because it is a conundrum, right? Like it just doesn't make sense. But I think for somebody like me, and honestly, most women are like me. So eating disorders, disordered eating, under eating, overeating, restricting, 1200 calories, you know, all these diets that we've been doing our whole lives. And we are conditioned to think we should eat a bowl of lettuce with some fat-free dressing on it with some lean chicken breast. And that should be, you know, two of our three meals a day or something. And that just doesn't work. And so I was eating like the few eggs eggs and then a couple of hamburger patties. And at that point, I have reduced my metabolism, right? I've reduced my hunger because I've been doing this for so long, like most women. And so I think my body on the days that I ate more, even though I, I mean, I probably never ate more than 2000 calories a day, I would say, I mean, if I had to guess, just adding things up in my head, I would say I probably never ate more than that. And so maybe on the days I ate the meat and cheese, I made meat and cheese casserole or carnivore pizza. Maybe I ate a little bit more because those are really high in calories. But I believe that what has happened is my metabolism had slowed down. So every time I ate more than that, it's like this. So if you have, if you have lowered your metabolism so much that you're burning the calories of a toddler and you eat the 3,500 calories extra in a day, is that still a pound, if your body has slowed your metabolism so much, like this is what I think people who say calories in, calories out, 3,500 calories is a pound, they're not taking this into consideration. If I've lowered my metabolism so much that I'm barely burning anything at this point because I'm so used to under eating, does it still take 3,500 calories to gain a pound? There's no way that's true. There's no way that's possible because I've slowed my metabolism. I don't have the metabolism of a normal 50 year old woman anymore who's has healthy metabolic health, right? I mean, I've messed myself up. So I believe that I slowed down my metabolism so much that every time I ate more than the 1200 or 1300 or whatever, wherever my body was, my body would hold on to it and say, okay, we're not letting go of this because a famine is still coming. There's a, I bet there's another famine coming. We can't get rid of this. And so then I under eat for another week or so. And then I have one day or two days where I eat a little bit more. My body says, we're holding on to that, right? So that explains the scale going up a pound, coming down half a pound, going up a pound, and then staying up that half a pound. And then the next week I'm up a pound, I'm down half a pound, I'm a pound. And at the end of a two week period, I'm up, you know, like, three quarters of a pound or something like that. Like it just was really slow. And every time it would happen, like after a couple of weeks, I would say, huh, I'm actually up a pound and a half from two weeks ago at this time. That's so strange. But then like two or three weeks go by and I'm maintaining, right? And I'm like, see, I'm not overeating because I'm maintaining. But in my head, I don't ever think, oh my goodness, I'm under eating again. And I don't know why I do that to myself. Like I can't make sense of it. Like I can't I just can't think of that in the moment. And then so another three weeks go by and I've maintained and I'm happy because I'm maintaining at least. And then all of a sudden it creeps up another pound over like a two week period. And I'm like, huh. And then before I know it, I'm up 12, 17 pounds, <laughs> right? Like, and so I honestly believe, and I don't know that there's any science for this. I'm gonna try to talk to Ben Bickman about it. I don't know what the science is, but I do believe and people have come to me and said, oh, you're not carnivoring hard enough. Believe me, I am carnivoring very, very hard. I am dedicated. I am exercising. I've been lifting weights five times a week since October, 
not lost an ounce. You know, I also didn't gain weight, which is good because I'm sure I've replaced some fat with muscle. Um, I'm walking three or four days a week. I probably could up that and get some more steps in. Maybe that could help. But as a 50 year old mom of four who is homeschooling and doing the absolute best that I can, don't come to me and say, that's impossible. You're doing it wrong. Um, I haven't talked about this yet, but I had somebody make a spoof video of me last week, um, just within the last couple of days, making fun of me for eating tallow and saying, that's why I gained, that's why I gained weight. Um, and the funny thing is the footage that they used of me eating the tallow was actually at my lowest weight. And that's how I got there was by eating lots of tallow. I was doing like 90% fat for a while there. And the weight was just kind of falling off at that point. And so it's ironic that the newer part with me talking about how I need to lose weight then shifted to, and this is actually why she gained the weight. Um, and we talked about it and he took the video down. You know, I explained to him that I don't think that's very nice. You don't know my story. Um, and he took the video down, which I was very grateful for. Um, he still doesn't believe that I gained the weight by under eating, but I'm telling you I did. And so, you know, I think that we dis if we dismiss, if, if other people dismiss women, who come to them in tears and say, I'm doing the best I can. I don't understand why I can't lose this weight. I'm watching it every single day. I'm being so careful. I'm hardly eating anything. And you say, oh, you're lying. You're probably overeating and you just don't know it. You turn them off and you make them quit and you make them give up, right? And so I think it should at least be in the back of your mind as a possibility if you're a coach or a nutritionist or something, if this person comes to you, a meticulous tracker, and says, I have all of this information. Here are my data points. This is what's happening to me. I've been doing this for six months. I've written down everything I put in my mouth for six months. I know I'm not overeating and yet I'm not losing. And you look them in the eye and they're in tears and saying, I don't understand. And you look them in the eye and you say to them, you're eating too much. If they're eating 12, 1300 calories a day, we're just going to give up, right? Why not at least say, raise that to 15 or 1600, give it a couple of weeks and let's see what happens, right? Because any nutritionist out there that's saying 12 or 1300 calories is enough for me or you is wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, that's like that, old advice. That's old advice. That's bad advice. Just like the 3,500 calories is going to make you gain a pound no matter who you are. And I think for somebody who weighs 400 pounds, 3,500 calories is not going to make them gain a pound, right? 3,500 extra calories is not going to make them gain a pound. But for me, it's very likely if I eat 3,500 extra calories, I'm going to gain two or three pounds because I had lowered my metabolism so much. I think it's a lot better now. And the reason I think that is because I'm starving all the time. I'm having a really <laughs> hard time now. At the beginning, I almost three weeks ago, I couldn't get the 1,600 calories in. At the end of the day, I was like fighting for those last few bites. I was like, I was looking at my meals. I was thinking, there's no way I'm going to be able to eat all that. And now I could eat twice that much. And I mean, I just ate lunch before we started this and my stomach is growling. Like I have awakened my metabolism. I have awakened my appetite. And now I have to count calories or I'm going to overeat, right? Like, so I think we can't just say calories in, calories out there, book closed, end of story. I think that's not fair. And so yeah. that's my 12 pound, 17 pound story. <laughs> and you know- Coming from somebody that I'm not an expert in this at all, but to me, like looking at this, it's like, okay, of course you can lose weight by not eating enough. I mean, mm -hmm. hello, anorexia. So right. I'm almost wondering if it's, if you're eating low enough, like super low, you'll waste away. But if you're only maybe slightly eating a little less and, and not, I'm not saying like just a normal, like calorie deficit, but a little less yeah. chronically. And that's maybe what's doing it then, because what is it doing, like you said, to your metabolism or your hormones? So it's mm -hmm. not like you're, you know, not eating enough. So then you get fat, but it's doing right. something inside your body and then it's making you struggle to lose weight. And yes. have you, I mean, maybe I shouldn't have even ask you this because it's your personal information, but like, have you done like testing and thyroid stuff? Like, is there anything else deeper going on? Um, well, this time it could definitely be partially hormones. I just turned 50. I ended up starting hormone replacement therapy in, um, November, either October or November, um, which I had, I had kind of started it a few times in the last couple of years and then backed off and got scared because there's so much conflicting information out there about it. So, um, I am doing the natural, you know, hormone 
replacement therapy at this point. Um, but I haven't, there's no, been no difference on the scale. I eventually decided to do that because I just wasn't sleeping. And I knew if I wasn't sleeping, other things are going to go down the toilet too. And so I was having a really hard time. I mean, literally laying in bed for three hours, staring at the ceiling in the middle of the night. And I don't use my phone. I've, I don't think I've ever used my phone in the middle of the night. I, our pastor actually talked about that this morning about getting your mind racing. And, you know, if you can't sleep in the middle of the night, everybody gets up and uses their phone. I don't do that. I just lay in bed waiting to go back to sleep, which causes extra anxiety, which keeps me up even longer. <laughs> so, so I wasn't doing very well because I wasn't sleeping. I was actually started to feel like I was losing my mind a little bit. I was just I was more emotional than usual. I was just not doing very well. And so I finally went back to the doctor and said, okay, I'm serious this time. Tell me about this. Tell me about the studies. You know, tell me about, and just like our food issues, there aren't any really good hormone replacement therapy studies that use bioidentical hormones in a controlled setting where you can say this is definitely what caused this breast cancer or, you know, whatever. Um, and so I decided, he said, if it was, if you were my wife, I would totally tell you to take it. If you were my daughter, I would totally tell you to do this so that you can have some relief and you can sleep and you can start feeling like yourself again. So I said, okay. So it's been about three months um, that I've been taking that. And the only difference I notice is my hormones are better. I'm sleeping better, but the weight has stayed exactly the same, you know, this whole time. And so that's not going to help. I did just get blood work back last week before we left town. So I have not been in to talk to the doctor about it yet. I have an appointment this coming week where we'll go over all of that. My thyroid might be a little bit off. So that's something that we will talk about and that we will deal with at the time. But 18, um, three years ago, when I gained that 18 pounds, everything was good. You know, at that point, it wasn't, my thyroid was fine. My hormones were fine at that point. So it wasn't until after that time when I had it tested I was gaining all that weight. Um, and it was not long after I gained the weight that I decided to start taking the hormones and then I stopped taking them. But I'm back, I'm on it now and I feel good and I'm sleeping. And so if I have to hold on to the 12 pounds to continue to feel good and be healthy, then I have to hold on to the 12 pounds, right? I mean, like, and I never would have said that before, but about midway through losing that 35 pounds, I said, I just feel so good that it's it for a lot of us it starts to not be so much about the weight loss. I mean obviously we want to lose the weight, but you start to feel so good and little things that were wrong with you suddenly aren't wrong anymore. Your um your body feels balanced, your emotions are balanced, your anxiety goes away like it starts to become about so much more than the weight loss for most of us. I mean obviously I want to lose that 12 pounds, but if I'm stuck where I am and I have to stay here, then so be it. You know, I mean, I, I want to get it off, but I think that's something that comes with the healing is saying, you know what, if I have to keep the weight, then I have to keep the weight. Yeah. And I mean, mindset is a huge part of things too. Yeah. So, you know, stressing about losing weight, that's not going to help you lose weight, right. but maybe coming to a nice calm place and you, and you think that way and you, you know, you do all the inner work, maybe that's like your body will finally like not be in fight or flight and just be like, ah, oh, and the rest of the weight will shed off. That's right. Hopefully that's it right. will be that magical, at least for me, because I'm working on all that stuff right now. Yeah. Um, speaking of emotionally eating, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I just, <laughs> I feel like it's been a lot better on carnivore, like pre-carnivore, lots of emotional eating and with horrible foods. Yeah. Now it's like, it's been way easier. I went through long periods of time where I did not, but just the stress from my book right now and just kind of stress from everything. Like I just, I mean, we all have a lot going on, but my book, little kids at home, homeschooling social media stuff. And I've been noticing how I'm reaching for food uh, to numb out and yeah. to not sit with my feelings. Oh my gosh, sitting with your feelings, the most uncomfortable thing you can do, but yeah. I'm working on it. So if anyone else is mm -hmm. like struggling with emotional eating, like we need to get to the root of, of it. And like, are you eating because you're stressed? Well, why are you stressed? How can you, you know, we're all going to have stress. You can't just eliminate all your stress, but it's more of like how you're reacting to it. So getting to the root of things, you know, I was talking to Jen and Scott from Wired for Healing and this, the interview with them was the day after I made this YouTube video on how I was struggling. And yeah. I didn't know like that next day, like what we were really going to talk about. And it was yeah. really like, oh, okay, this interview was made just for me. And it was a nice reminder of 
you know, getting back to the little things that I used to do for myself to make myself a happier person, like Mm -hmm. doing, you know, morning journaling, gratitude, um, meditations, like all those little things, like being healthy is a mind, body, soul thing. It's not just about what you're eating. And the answer isn't just carnivore harder. Like you need to do some other things to like keep yourself well. So that's kind of what I'm working on right now is really doing the self-care and getting Mm -hmm. to the root of the issues. And instead of turning to food, when I get stressed out or upset, even though it's carnivore food, I'm trying to find other ways to, to channel that and just go play, have fun. You know, I feel like we're so, I don't know. I mean, I noticed with myself, I, I live a lot of my life just on social media and it's like, I need to like put the phone down and get out and, and live your life, have fun, play, be a kid again, go to a basketball tournament for a week with your family, (laughs) with your kids and run around to the gym and spend, you know, four hours a day sitting, watching basketball games. You'll get off your phone. Yeah. <laughs> I got a notification today that my screen time was way down last week. I was like, yeah, because I was at a gym watching kids play basketball for hours every day. I mean, it's, you know, um, but I just, I wanted to say, um, you know, a lot of people will go on vacation and come back and say they lost weight. Right. And I do think that for people that are super restrictive, most of the time when you go on vacation, you let loose a little bit and drop weight, I think because you're eating more. Right. And dropping the stress too. And dropping the stress. Yeah. And I can honestly say that the times where I realize I'm under eating, if I go ahead and eat 2000 calories, like two days in a row, just to see what'll happen, I drop a pound. Um, and so that's the other reason that makes me think that it's definitely, you know, the not eating enough. Um, and so I just wanted to point that out because there have been a lot of times where, you know, and, and the other part of what happens to me, and this is going back to the, the last conversation, but what the last question, but what a lot of times what happens to me is, I eat, you know, I don't eat until lunchtime and I have a couple of eggs and then I eat again at like three o'clock and then dinner time rolls around and I say, well, I'm not really very hungry. So I'll just wait until tomorrow to eat. And then I end up eating all of my food in a, like a three hour window for the day. And I'm getting like a 20 hour fast in, but how many calories could I possibly, that's why one meal a day, I think doesn't work for so many women. Cause how many calories could I possibly get in between, you know, noon and three o'clock? It's not very many, you know, and you do that day after day after day. And that's how I end up, you know, kind of under eating. It's not that I'm not carnivoring hard enough. It's definitely that I'm not eating enough. And then if I raise it up and pay attention to it and make sure it's higher, I almost always lose a little bit of weight. Um, but now I'm back to kind of an even keel, just trying to start out fresh with those calories and macros and, you know, just kind of, just kind of see what happens and I don't know, track it so I can tweak it. Yeah, that's good. And I'm glad you're having some success. Um, so someone was asking, <laughs> and this will be interesting because I know your answer, like the social impacts of carnivore and even like getting, um, backlash from family. Like what does your mm-hmm. family think about the way that you eat? Do they eat this they, way? Um, sorry. Hang on. <laughs> Okay. Um, I kicked something over. Uh, okay. So no, my family um, does not. My husband does a lot. He eats like this a lot, um, but not always. And my kids know they think I'm crazy. Uh, I don't, it's really funny. I will tell everybody that I meet about carnivore and how amazing it is. And it did this for me and it did that for me and it did this for my friend, you know, But when it comes to family, I won't talk about it. So it was actually a year before my family knew really what I was doing. Like (laughs) I was avoiding other foods because of this post sickness that I won't name left me with a taste and smell issue where things smelled and tasted like skunk. And so that's initially why I started. And so they just thought that I was doing it to avoid those things like fruits and vegetables, garlic, onion peanut butter, popcorn, coffee, like all of those things that tasted and smelled so bad. They thought I was just avoiding those things. And it was about a year before I finally just said, well, I just eat meat now. (laughs) I just (laughs) eat meat, eggs and cheese now. And they were like, what? You can't live like that, mom. Mom, you have to have fruits and vegetables. Mom, that's too much fat, mom. I mean, I'm still dealing with, with that. You know, I taught them to eat healthy and I did. Like their first foods we're never out of a can or a jar. I mean, not of a out of a jar. I did use canned things. Like um, their first like real food that I gave them was green beans out of a can with no salt added. You know, canned foods that don't have additives are actually, you know, they have preserved their freshness. And I would like, I had a can opener in the car when the kids were little and I would add a red light, open up a can, hold the top on, dump the water out the window and hand them this can of green beans. And that's what they would eat in the car. So my kids ate 
what I thought was really healthy, right? We ate lots of lean meats. I thought I was doing the right thing, but I have inadvertently taught them. And they're not going to read all the books that I have read. They're not going to watch your podcast and and mine, and they're not going to watch Dr. Chafee's YouTube channel, and they're not going to learn these things right now. You know, they're 23, 21, 17, and 15. So they're not going to learn all of these things right now. What I hope, though, is that it comes back around later. Our oldest daughter actually does really well. She's never been into, like, candy and junk food. So, so she eats really well. She does not eat a lot of fast food. And when she does, it's definitely the healthier options. And we don't eat a lot of processed foods at home. You know, I'm, I'm a, you know, a mom of almost adult children and I'm doing the best I can to not alienate myself from them, cause lots of stress in our household. They don't eat a lot of processed foods. They are definitely, they definitely eat less carbohydrates and more protein and fat than your average kid their age does. And so with that, I'll just be happy. And, you know, they know like this basketball tournament that we just came back from, everybody puts together goodie bags for the kids. Everybody brings something in and puts it in these brown paper bags and the kids get to take them on the trip and they have all these snacks. My girls intentionally ate the things that they were going to eat that had sugar in them. They ate before the tournament started and throughout the entire tournament while other kids are eating, you know, sugar and junk food and using sugar as their fuel, you know, and car carving up and sugaring up before a game and eating Skittles and, you know, and stuff like that, like to get their sugar up. So they'll have energy for the game. My girls are eating, you know, meat sticks and a piece of string cheese. And so they do run on carbohydrate. Their body does run on carbohydrates because they have, they are not ketogenic, but they eat a lot more protein than most other kids, you know? So, um, so they eat all their sugary stuff before, um, you know, before the games actually started and then again in the car on the way home from the tournament because they wouldn't eat it during because they're like, they want to feel good. You know what I mean? They don't want to feel like garbage. They don't want to have a crash in the middle of a basketball game because they didn't get the timing right. You know what I mean? They they want to fuel up. They want to have some calories in their system and they want to eat things that are better for you. And so it's just really interesting to see people who, you know, stop and get a um, Dunkin' Donuts you know, Frappuccino or one of those iced coffees or something on the way to, to play in a basketball game, like, or a donut or something like that. Like that's not the right kind of fuel. Sure. Your energy will be up, but you better hope it lasts for the whole game. You know? Yeah. I mean, we don't do, we've never done sports drinks like Gatorades and things like that. I mean, unless somebody had the stomach flu and that's their whole lives. I've never been into that kind of stuff. The artificial colors, the artificial flavors and stuff like that. That's not something that we've ever done. Um, and so you see kids with a bottle of Gatorade this big, you know, for one basketball game and, my girls are just drinking water, you know, that's I mean, good. They give yeah, them out I mean, to my three-year-old soccer game. Like the soccer snacks for a three-year-old had ridiculous. like red Gatorade. I'm like, are we this naive? Like to what we're that's feeding our kids? It's, yeah. It's not electrolytes anyway. Gatorade <laughs> is not an electrolyte. It's not. Yeah. It's absolutely ridiculous and mm -hmm. disgusting. And it makes me sad that so yeah. many people like don't know, I guess, or maybe mm -hmm. they know, but they don't care. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, the whole kid thing. But it sounds like your kids are doing good. And you know what? They're I don't think I would have I mean, even if I knew about this at that age, I probably yeah. wouldn't have cared. No. Like you're not you you feel invincible. Like yeah. not that you don't care because there are some people I see on social media that eat this way, but it's just yeah. different mindset at that yeah. age. And as of right now, they're metabolically healthy. You know, at least their first foods weren't sugar. You know, I mean, they did have bananas, you know, as one of their first foods, but I never used processed baby food. I don't think, I think I bought maybe two jars at some point, you know, when one of my kids was 10 months, when my youngest, my, my, when my oldest was about 10 months old, I bought a couple of jars of like the oats or something and we tasted them and we threw them away. Like I never, I just never did that. I, they were going to eat what we were eating or they were going to eat, you know, the canned vegetables without the salt in them or, you know, so I've always, I feel like I've always I always strived to make sure that they were eating healthier than average, at least, um, because I grew up that that way mostly. And so I tried to do that for them. So right now they're metabolically healthy. They are extremely active. Basketball is a four or five day a week sport. And so is volleyball when they play volleyball. And even like on the off season now, which start, which started yesterday, um, they are still very active. You know, we're still going to the gym so they can practice. We're still very active. We're outside a lot. And so I'm not worried for them right now. I, they don't eat a lot of fast food and I, you know, I'd like to keep it that way, but they do pretty well. So I'm, I'm grateful that they're not just, you know, like eating what your average person eats in a day. Yeah. They're, it sounds like they're doing better than 95% of the population out there. I hope so.
I hope so. That's the goal, right? I mean, if you can do better than 95%, then you're doing pretty darn good, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. So we have one last thing I want to talk about before we wrap this up. And um, I put a question box out there to the community and I kept everyone else's anonymous, but I'm going to throw out who this is just okay. for fun to say hi to Jen from hi, delighted Jen. to meet you. Um, so she said, do you feel pressure to be perfect? Because so many people are watching us. Like what, how do you feel about that? Do you feel pressured or do you not care? <laughs> I think uh, kind of in between because this, this video that, you know, the guy made upset me, you know, it did. But even though I know that I have valid reasons for thinking what I think and doing what I'm doing, um, and I feel like we're all on the same page. So don't mock me. We're all just trying to, to help people and save people, right? Like if you have a question about it, send me a message and say, hey, you know, are you sure this is what's going on with you? Because I'm a trainer and I think I might be able to help. I don't really think it's from under eating. And let me have a conversation with you about it before you make a video, you know, mocking me. I just think that's not fair. Um, plus I'm a 50 year old mom of four for crying out loud. Stop making fun of me. Stop making fun of Courtney. Stop making fun of us. Like, you know, we are doing the best we can. We're here trying to help. So if you don't like it, just move on, right? Um, so I guess I feel like that. Like, I'd like to just say to people, if you don't like it and you don't agree, just move on, right? Because there are some people that are going to hear what we have to say and care about it and ask us questions about it. And there are people who enjoy watching us and hearing from us, even if we're not perfect. And we're not. Nobody's perfect. There is not one single human being on the earth that's perfect, right? Not even one. And so I'm doing the best I can, right? And I didn't, I mean, honestly, when it, when this started for me, it wasn't like necessarily to do what we're doing. I don't even know. I was sharing my meals. Like when I first started, it was like, Hey, I'm going to eat just meat, eggs and cheese. And, and I saw what other people were doing. Like I saw Kelly Hogan and Laura Spath and Michaela Peterson, you know, when I first started and Sean Baker, and I just thought, well, if they weren't sharing their stories, I wouldn't have heard about it and I wouldn't be getting healthier. And so when I started, I was just going to share it for people who, wanted to know, like I wanted to know, like if I could help one person, then it would be worth me making that video or whatever. And so, you know, I try not to worry about not being perfect. Do I sometimes feel like, am I really one to give advice? I've gained 12, 17 pounds back, right? Am I really one to give advice? But I think I've heard from so many people and it helped so many people who most of were under eating, by the way, I just want to say that one more time. <laughs> most of the people that come to me and say, I'm not losing what's going on and we track their calories, they're under eating. I would say nine, nine times out of 10, at least the day they send me was under eating. And I do think that that's typical, it, they're typical days. And so most of the time people are under eating, but anyway, so nobody's perfect, but I've helped enough people. I've talked to enough people. I've listened to enough people. I've read, you know, 20 or 25 books. I've watched video after video and listened to podcast after podcast. And so I do think that I have good advice for people. And so I give that advice knowing that I'm not perfect and knowing that it won't work for everybody. And so I give people the advice and then I say, if that doesn't work, let me know. Track a couple of weeks and come back to me and let me know and we'll and we'll see if we can figure it out together because I'm not perfect. And it, even what works, even if it was working for me, even if I had kept my weight off, what worked for me to get there might not necessarily work for everybody. Right. And so I can't say, well, this is going to work for you. And if it doesn't, you're doing it wrong. And I don't think that's good advice for anybody to be giving to other people. I feel like that's not fair and it's not nice. And it makes people think that they're just not good enough or that they're hopeless. Right. And I don't think we can have that. We can't have people coming to us and feeling hopeless, right? We have to be there for people and be there to help people. So I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Jen's not perfect, right? Okay. Speak for yourself. I am absolutely <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, no, but I don't feel pressure, I guess, to be perfect or to be the perfect carnivore. Um, yeah. I'm just showing up, sharing my journey. And yes, right. people are watching and they have things to say, God, you know, heaven forbid I have a pickle. You know, right. some people don't like that, the yeah. carnivore police. But yeah, I mean, I just share what I'm doing. And, you know, when I first started sharing this, it wasn't like, oh, I'm carnivore. I'm going to start sharing my journey. Like I was already showing up on social media. Right. So for me, it was just a, oh, this is what I'm trying right now. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm just, yeah, sharing my thing and hopefully mm -hmm. to like help and inspire other people. But yeah, I just, yeah, I don't, I don't feel pressured. I guess I feel right. a lot of other things yeah. <laughs> on social media, but 
Yeah. And I will say my page was a Weight Watchers page before I started a carnivore. You know, I mean, I was sharing those meals because that's what was helping me. I was watching other people's meals and that's what was helping me. Before that, it was, it, I was sharing a lot of juicing stuff before that, you know what I mean? So this is the longest for me. Um, and you mentioned the pickles. So I'll just say I put jalapenos on a burger while we were at the cabin for this tournament and oh, the, oh, the messages I got for putting jalapenos. And I will say, um, I got some sores in my mouth from the jalapenos. I still can't chew on this side. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I learned my lesson. Maybe not though. Yeah. I actually, um, had some grilled onions on a burger last week and uh -huh. horrible decision. My stomach did not appreciate really? that. Yeah. 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 And it's funny. Cause it's like, I don't really have the desire for that anymore, but it just right. like once in a while, it's like, yeah. and you know why it sounds good is because they're sweet and right. they're caramelized. And yes. so I'm aware of that now. Like, okay, yeah. I, I'm not craving raw onions. Yes. Um, yeah. Funny how that happens. Yeah. So now I'm like, okay, I get why I'm wanting that because it is yep. the sweetness. Um, but yeah, I, I probably won't do that ever again. I was yeah. not feeling good. <laughs> well, that's how we learn. Right. I mean, like, you know, sometimes you got to let your kids get hurt so that they learn why you keep telling them not to do that. I mean, not extremely hurt, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. And then they do it and they get hurt. And they won't do it again after that. You know what I mean? Nothing big, yeah. obviously, but you know, it's kind of like with our children, like, you know, we're, we're still learning and we're still growing and we don't know what our bodies will accept. Right. Like oh, if this is elimination and every now and then we try to add something back in just to see and sometimes we get sores in our mouth and sometimes our stomachs get upset and it tasted good at the time and we thought we would try it. And then maybe we won't try it again. Maybe I'll try jalapenos again next week because that's who I am. <laughs> like just, but yeah. I want to, I want some jalapenos. I will say that the other thing that I have had, and I haven't shared videos of it or anything, but, um, I have had an artichoke here and there, like a, a fresh natural artichoke steamed where you dip the leaves in the butter. Um, and I have had that on occasion and I haven't had any kind of issues with that at all. Um, I just haven't shared it because I wasn't like, I wasn't showing like what I eat in a day at that time, or I wasn't sharing macros at that time. And so I haven't shared that, but um, I have mentioned it in several videos that I've done that. It's the one thing that I added back in here and there on occasion. It's a special treat for my kids and I, because artichokes are stinking expensive. <laughs> and so it's just a fun thing for my kids and I, we sit around the table and it takes like 30 minutes to eat an artichoke and it's fun. And that's something that as they were growing up, I taught them how to do, and we love doing that together. And so on occasion, and I would like to be able to get to that point, right? Like I heard Karen Miles say one time, and this was like right at the very beginning for me, maybe it was an interview with Kelly. I'm not positive, but she said that even having been a carnivore for so long, if one of her grandkids brings her a cookie and say, grandma, taste this, she's going to taste the cookie, right? And I just, I would like to get to a point where I could do that without it being a binge, without feeling horribly guilty about it and, when not, and without needing the whole cookie to say that I tasted it, you know what I mean? Or needing a whole sleeve of the cookies to say that I tasted it. And I would love to get to that. I don't have grandkids yet, um, but if if my if my daughters make something really good and they want me to taste it, I want to get to a point where I will say, okay, I'll take a bite. Yeah, I feel like, okay. yeah, I feel like I've heard Jules from Fit Girl Jules mention mm -hmm. that before. Like yeah. I, I am almost positive it was, uh, it was her that said, my kids made me a cake. So I had a bite of the cake or whatever. Right. And it's yeah. funny you bring this up because Archer made something last week and I don't even remember what it was. Um, it had something not carnivore in it. And he's like, mom, I, I made this for you. I really want you to try it by. And I'm like, oh gosh, what do I do? Like, I don't want to trigger anything for me, but I also don't want to like hurt his feelings. Right. So I had yeah. a bite. And then when he wasn't looking, I spit it out. Um, but yeah, I, and I've thought about that too. Okay. Like what would I do in the future if my kids made yeah. me a cake? Like cake is one thing compared mm -hmm. to like whatever he made last week. I don't even remember, but like a full yeah. on cake, like, yeah. yeah, that would be nice to, you know, have a bite and not hurt your kids feelings, but right. also like, oh my gosh, is that going to lead yeah. to the whole slice to the whole cake? And then right. you're binging all week. So right. that's and they where the inner work comes in. <laughs> yeah. And they did make something recently. I wish I could remember what it was because they bake a lot. They made something recently though. And they, and I can see the look on their face when they come to me and say, mom, will you taste this? Right. And the look on their faces and they're good. They're good cooks too. I mean, they, they bake, they used to have a gluten-free baking business. They still take orders, but they haven't done it in a while. But when they make something, it's good, you know, and I would like to be able to take a bite, you know, as long as it doesn't have wheat in it. Cause I can't have wheat. I haven't had wheat in probably 
12, 13 years. So as long as it doesn't have weed in, I'd like to, and my son does that sometimes he's 21. He still lives at home and he'll come home with something and say, please just take one bite. And I want to be able to say, okay, and take the one bite and enjoy that with him and say, wow, thanks for letting me try that, you know, and not have it not be scared of it. Yeah. I'm but, still a little bit scared of it. Right. But then on the other hand, it's like, why do, why do we need to eat things that we don't want to just to not hurt somebody's feelings right. too? And I think if it's your kids, it's different. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, and I want them to, I want them to come home with their kids and their spouses and say, just wait to say to their kids, just wait until you try grandma's chili or just wait until you try grandma's whatever. And I don't have many things like that left. They did say it about my chili yesterday. So that's good. I still make good regular chili. <laughs> um, but I want them to have those things. They say to their kids, you just wait until you try grandma's, you know, whatever. And that's hard as a carnivore because nobody's going to be saying, wait till you try grandma's steak, right? It's a steak. <laughs> Although hey, maybe it could be steak. My father-in-law makes, we all get really excited when he's having a cookout because of his steak. It's going to be steak. Yeah, I I decided it's going to be steak is going to be the thing. Wait till you try grandma's steak. There um, you go. Or some but barbecue. Yeah, but I, yeah. I'd like to be able to be though, the kind of person that when somebody makes me something special or one of my kids says, mom, this is so good. You have to try it, that I can try it without feeling like it's going to poison me without feeling that fear uh, and the anxiety of what it's going to do to me emotionally, you know, being able to take one bite of something and say, wow, that's really good. Thanks for sharing that with me. You know, so that's kind of my goal, I guess, aside from weight and health and things like that, I would like to get to a place. And I tried over Christmas, we planned on going out for Mexican and I th said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to have a normal meal at a Mexican restaurant without asking for something special. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to eat with my family. I'm going to enjoy it and I'm going to be okay with it. And it's going to be just that meal because I had planned it. It started the day before with chocolate and that very day it was the day before Christmas Eve. Um, I had to run into the store for something. I bought several boxes of chocolate covered cherries and ate them all. I mean, it was not, it was not good. It was a really bad, like four and a half days. Christmas morning, I woke up crying. You know, it was not good. I will not do that to myself next year. I will not. And I'm always on here talking about how go into the holidays with a plan, feel good about it and know that at the end of Christmas day, you're going to feel really good when everybody else has, you know, a carb hangover and doesn't feel good. I want to feel my best, especially on the holidays. And then I blew it. And I just, I think getting past that part was even harder for me than getting over the carbs and getting that back out of my system. You know what I mean? Just knowing that I did that to myself, knowing that I shouldn't do that to myself, you know? Yeah. It's but that fun. makes me wonder as, you know, sugar addicts or whatever that we are, you know, if there will ever be that place, because I don't think, you know, if Jeff were to be like, oh, I made this old fashioned cocktail, have a sip, please have a sip. I want you to see what it tastes like. That would probably not be a good idea. So right. why would I do why that do with food? You yeah, know, that's really true. That's really true. Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why I'd like to get to that point, but you're right. And we do relate this a lot. You know, a bunch of us relate this uh, and a lot of people do as that's just like being an alcoholic or a drug addict. And I do believe that that it is. So you're right. Why would I expect it to be okay with one bite of food? Because it really is lighting up something in our brain yeah, and true. you can do all the inner work you want. And maybe, you know, I could have one sip and that would be the end of it. But it's like, why even push why? it? I don't know. Yeah. But maybe because it's still new. I mean, I'm only... Yeah. I'll be three years sober um, this April, and mm -hmm. I definitely don't think I could have one drink and let it go. I mean, maybe I could, but I'd obsess about it the rest of the day. I'd right. want more. Yeah, that's kind true. Kind of like sugar. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so I don't know. I guess because, I guess because it's food and it's a necessary thing. And, um, we're surrounded by it all the time and we have to be, because we have to survive. We have to have food to survive. And as long as it were a healthier version of food, like, I'm not going to say if my kid brought me a Twinkie and said, here, taste this, that I'm going to do that obviously. Right. But if it's something natural or homemade or something like that, and somebody says, oh, take a bite of this, maybe I could do it. You know what I mean? Maybe if it's not the processed version of something, something natural, homemade with extra love in it, you know, maybe I could take a bite. You know, if I go to my daughter's house and she's made something really special and wants me to try it, it's, it's hard for me to say no, you know, and I don't want them to feel bad. Like I don't care. So I don't know. I mean, I guess, um, 
because we talk about this, you and I have talked about this before. Like if you're at a party, people don't pressure you to drink, but they pressure you to eat the cake, you know? And that's true. That's absolutely true. I don't know. I need to think about that more. Maybe I don't need to be able to taste their stuff, but. Well, it's just interesting how we, um, like correlate like food with love, you know, because you have food at every like celebration, even like it's people's love language. So I get it. Like it's a way to like connect. Um, but it could just be a slippery slope. And for me, sorry, I'll hurt your feelings over this. I'm not going to have a bite at least not right now. I'm not there. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know that I am, you know, after what happened over Christmas, I honestly can't say, uh, but that didn't happen. I didn't have a four and a half or five day binge over one of my, my kids saying, oh, you know, we just made this, will you taste it, you know, and take one bite of it and then ask them to package it up and not put it in front of me anymore. You know, this happened at a Mexican restaurant where I ate my weight and chips, like it started <laughs> off that way. Right. But if it started off with one of my kids coming to me and saying, I just made this, will you taste it? I think I might be able to do better. And just take yeah. a bite. Instead of allowing, like you went into the Mexican place, allowing yourself to have that full meal. Yes. But I wonder if you allowed yourself to just have one chip, if it would have gone in because it's like, oh, I already had one. I'm already off carnivore. May as well have more. That's how That's I would That's what would have happened. <laughs> That's what would have <laughs> happened. And then it would have been like, well, the day is ruined. So I might as well have whatever I want. And then the next day I would have been like, but tomorrow's Christmas. So this is Christmas Eve. I might as well just, That's what happens. Yeah. Right. And I saw somebody say the other day, like, for so many of us, it's all or nothing. So why can't it be all or something? Why can't we do just a little bit of whatever that thing is, right? And I don't know. Because we're addicts. Huh? Because we're addicts. Right, exactly. Right. So I don't know. I don't know yeah. if I'm there. I'm probably not if you consider what happened over Christmas, you know, and that hasn't yeah. been long enough ago for me to say, oh, but I can, I could do it now, you know, because I thought I could do it then. <laughs> and once I gave myself that permission off the rails. Yeah. It's easy because you're like, I already went off. I already screwed up. I'm just going to have this. And then by then it's in your system. So it's addicting. Like you want more, your body wants more, you're craving it. So yeah. Slippery slope. Hard. So hard. So hard. And we have to have food. Yeah. We have to have food to survive. So that's what makes it hard. You don't have to have alcohol. Like you don't have to have drugs, like, but we eat every day. So yeah, you will go to parties where there's no alcohol. You will go to parties where there's no drugs. You're never going to go to a party where there's not food. Exactly. Right. But hasn't carnivore, I feel like made this a little bit easier because you're not always having like the sweet things anyways. Like, I mean, this is the longest I've ever stayed on track with anything. Me too. Yeah, me too. Up until, I mean, yeah, up until Christmas, it was the longest I hadn't had like real sugar, I think one time in more than two years or two and a half years. And that was because I was helping my girls make a cake for a, um, for something. I can't remember what a special order or something. And as I was cleaning up, I had frosting on my hand and I licked it just instinctively by accident, you know? <laughs> so I have to count that. I have to say I had a little bit of sugar that day. Um, and I'm not going to say I didn't have one spoon after that, but I was able to stop, <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, wow, that's really good. <laughs> like, you know, but then but I, had to, bite. <laughs> I was able to stop myself that time. Um, and so, yeah, it's, you have to have food and there's always going to be food at a party. There's always going to be food at a gathering. Somebody's always going to be saying, just try this, which they don't do typically if you're an alcoholic, you know? So yeah, I wish it wasn't food. I wish food wasn't my thing. You know, but unfortunately it is my mom's an alcoholic. My dad's a drug addict and my sister uh, was anorexic and bulimic her whole life since she was like 10. She almost died several times um, from anorexia and um, it was going to be in there somewhere for me. I was going to have some sort of an addiction and I don't know if I'm glad it's food or not. (laughs) I don't think I am. I don't think I am. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I get what you mean. And I feel that for sure. Yeah. It seems like almost everybody has some sort of addiction, Mm -hmm. whether it's what you just named or coffee or cigarettes or whatever exercise, you know, I feel like everyone's got their one vice that they can't stop. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. It's hard. It's hard to figure it out. Yeah. And none of us are perfect. So except for me, but we established that already. Sorry. (laughs) All right. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, Super amazing. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. Um, I'm excited to hear, like, let me know you guys what you think of this. Um, Cause I'm, I'm invested in the whole not eating enough um, and gaining weight. So let me know you guys, if you've had experience 
with this or like what your thoughts are. Yeah. And thank you so much. Anything else yeah. you want to say before we say bye? No, I just think for people who are curious, people who are carnivore curious mm-hmm. and not carnivore yet, I think, and, and you've tried everything else because we all have tried everything else. I think just give it a go. Like you're not going to do any damage in a month that you can't undo. Certainly not any more damage than you've ever done with any diet that you've ever followed, except this one could be life-changing, could literally change your life. And so I just want to leave off with that. Like, just give it a try, especially if you're a carb addict or a sugar addict or a food addict of any kind, carnivore will set things straight and clear out your brain and let you see things better. Yes. Yes. Give it a shot Um, and go follow Serena on social media. And she also makes the best tallow. Um, I've used a lot of stuff. Hers is all whipped and amazing. I'm lathered up in it right now. I use it every day. Um, I'm trying to think what my discount code is. I think it's Luna. It might be Courtney Luna. Try one of those. (laughs) Yeah. Or Um, ask one of us. I can look it up. Yeah. Or, or message me, or if I remember, I'll actually link it, but that might be pushing it. Um, (laughs) and let them know where they can find you and where you're at. Yeah. So I'm Serena.Carnivore on Instagram and Carnivore Revolution is my YouTube channel and you can get tallow and uh, facial oil cleanser and beard and hair oil and lip balm and spray on emu oil lotion and things like that at my website. And it's purely tallow.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. I love you. Love you. Bye everyone.